we're so excited to be here. Um, before I start in on the questions, Eric has some news <laughs> that's really thrilling and well deserved. So take it away. The news is that I I flooded my apartment. Oh, no, 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 no. The good news. The and, good um, news. I was like, <laughs> um, I just found out right as I was walking out the door that it, this is an Eric Times bestseller. <laughs> his first cookbook, and so congratulations, well deserved. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, all of you will discover if you haven't already, um, and I'll see what copies are for sale. So this, you know, the first thing, of course, that struck me about the book is that it's an homage to your mother and your relationship with her. So I wanted to ask you, what was her reaction when you told her you were going to write this book with all the recipes in it, and then what was her reaction when she held it for the first time? And can you answer it without crying? Let's see. <laughs> right, it's very I'm very raw right now. That, that news was really intense. Um, and felt really appropriate to balance out the, the horror of my last 24 hours. But <laughs> um, each moment of this whole tour has felt fake. Like I'm standing in water in my apartment. And I'm like, this, is, this feels like a dream. And then the call. Felt like a dream too. So anyway, and, I, and this is feels like a dream because you know I I I read the food section every Friday. I always look forward to a good appetite. I mean, not to you know just not to embarrass you, but like um, I was a huge Melissa Clark fan, and so I think I'm like you know this all feels very. I keep saying it feels fake. Uh, I'll try to you know be more present. But do, do you need to pinch you? I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, like brain is in, in the sky right now, but you know, okay, my mom is a little more grounded though. She, um, when I told her I was writing the book, she was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure one of the first things she said was, oh, does this mean I'm going to be famous then? And I was like, maybe, I don't know. And, um, but I think she, I think a lot of people know her name, Jean, so that probably means she's pretty famous now. But um, the funny thing is she really doesn't care about fame. Um, she's very... Uh, private and she likes her, her peace and she's very unfazed by all of this. She's proud, of course, but um, I was trying to call her. I was like, I wanted to have that moment where I was like, Mom, like, we made the bestseller list and she didn't pick up, so. Jane <laughs> <laughs> is very unsentimental. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I was actually a good story. I'll try to keep it short, but um, uh, my partner Paolo always says that I speak in monologues, so sorry, I'll set up. That's right, that's right, Jeff. That's right, and we're here to listen to you. So. <laughs> well, yeah, this story's nice, and this will make me cry probably, but um, I just got back from the airport, and it was the night before New Year's, so it was the 31st, you know, and my dad had picked me up around like 1140 or something, and we were driving down 141 in Atlanta, and you know, I think we just kind of realized, oh, we're going to miss the countdown, so we should do it in the car. So it felt really nice to, <laughs> sorry, share that moment in the car with him. And then I would also just been through, like, hell out there for it. It's another story for another essay another time. But I really believe in the law of averages. I think, like, things always balance out somehow. And so when I got home, um, uh, my mom had torn into the book, the, the package of the book. No, I, I, I told her she could, but she, um, she got to see it first, so. I think she was just like holding it and, you know, we were both sort of observing it as an object and being like, this is so weird. Like, so it just felt really appropriate though that me coming back home was the, on January 1st is the day that I held my book for the first time. Um, and I'm really glad I got to share it with my mom and she was really, you know, she was really proud. So she's unsentimental, but I bet she was a little bit sentimental in that moment. No, not no, really. No. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, look at this. Yeah, she. Um, but yeah, I'm glad she's the one who saw it first because the book starts with her opening my mail, and you know, it's like perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Um, okay, in the context of your book, where do your recipe, where do your mom's recipes end and your recipes begin, or is it a, a, a sort of a continuum? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so <laughs> glad to be interviewed by Melissa Clark. Um, you know, so she is a reporter. New York Times reporter. That's just such a good, I mean, I just, I, reading your stuff is so personal that, and I think, you know, I don't know if all of you agree, but don't you feel like you know him a little bit? And 
Eric and I have worked together for the past two years, but we don't know each other that well because COVID. And so I know you through your words. And so this is like a pleasure to get to actually, like these are all the questions I wanted to ask you. I just get to do it you know, in front of everybody else. <laughs> That's great. Um, I already forgot the question, sorry. The question is, uh, your, your mom's recipes and your recipe begin, or is it a continuum? And how do you, how do you think about it? Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if you guys are familiar with The Wreckers. Um, it's a band formed by Michelle Branch and one of her best friends, Jessica Harp. And um, on their one record that they made together, Stand Still Look Pretty. This is a deep cut reference for, for all of you Michelle Branch fans. <laughs> Um, she, you know, it's really lovely, like, when one of them has written more of it, that person takes lead, and then when the other person has written more of it, they take lead, and then, you know, the other person's harmonizing, so it's sort of, I feel like that is kind of like a record where you, like, you know, one of us took lead um, on some recipes, and uh, the other took lead on, on the other ones, so, you know, you can kind of tell by maybe the head note, I, I, I pretty clearly say, like, this is my mom's, like, kid shit, like, she did this, and I'm sort of a tester on that, and, you know, the TV dinners chapter, that's all, all me, because that's kind of like a representation of the way I was cooking as a Food Network baby, I call myself. Um, it's like a 13 year old sitting in front of the television learning how to cook. And so I think you can kind of, you can kind of tell a little bit, but um, there are moments where uh, we, we kind of collide, and those are the recipes that I think are uh, kind of the most exciting. Um, you know, the lemon pepper pugogi, it's like this crispy version. Uh, you know, maybe I took a lead on it, but my mom sang like really loud harmonies over it. Um, and, <laughs> and then she's the one who really picked that version. I had like 10 different pugogis, and that was like, a dish that was really um, stressful to try to piece together. And she's the one who kind of gave me confidence to go with the, the really wacky one, you know? The other ones are a little more traditional. Um, I mean, I'll put those out someday. They're a little more soy sauce based and maybe the cut of meat is a little different, but she loved eating the lemon pepper one. It's, it's just really surprising, the flavor. Um, you know, like when you have that much black pepper in something, especially paired with lemon, you kind of realize how much it tastes like uh, a fruit, like so, so fruity, so peppery, and just, it's like, oh, this is what black pepper tastes like. I love recipes that make you realize, oh, that's what that tastes like. Um, and and she really loved eating that one. And she was like, Eric, just just do it. Like, who cares what authenticity gatekeepers you know are gonna say? That you're always gonna have people who you know think something should be you know more like the way their mother does it. But you know what I like to say to those people is, I'm not I'm not their mother. Yeah. <laughs> did, did that worry you? Was that like a little voice on your shoulder, like, oh, the authenticity gatekeepers are going to be mad? Or Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It gave me eyes, actually. Really? It was, um, yeah, I mean, there is, I mean, this is like TMI, but when I was writing the, the Panchan story for The Times, um, it, it, it was like one of the first times I was really like writing about Korean food so publicly, and in this book, I was like figuring it out. You know, I was in the beginning stages of writing it, and I'm very confident, and I didn't know anything really, um, and I thought I, <laughs> I, I, I got shingles. Um, Seriously? And, yeah, I got shingles, and, um, and I think it was from the stress, and um, so that's how it started. You know? <laughs> and then as I started cooking through it more, and then, you know, getting more confidence in the subject matter, and then having an opinion about everything, and it took like recipe by recipe to be like, you know what, dang, I, like, I do have an opinion about this. <laughs> um, and I, I just really, I, I, I think this book kind of navigates that discovery. And I, I, you know, in the beginning of the book, I'm 17, and it ends with me being, you know, I was joke, TK years old, because um, I don't want to tell people my age, but it, it says I'm 30 in the book, so. Uh, and it's 23, yeah. And um, so I, I think I just, I, I wanted to show that I, I, I wasn't an expert when I started this, and I'm still not an expert, and I don't believe, I don't know if I believe in experts, like, it's the curiosity that I wanted to show in the book, so that when you open it up, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of talking to you um, as someone who is also learning, and um, I sort of show that process through the book, and I, I hope that makes it feel more, um, I don't know, not as intimidating. I think people get intimidated by um, other cuisines, but, yeah, so I, that was really important to me to get across, I think. Now, were there recipes that your mom just vetoed? You were on a recipe, <laughs> you know what, this is just not. 
Yeah, yeah. She's really a harsh critic, um, but in the best way. I think, you know, when I say that we took turns, you know, taking lead, um, she, if she didn't like the taste of something, it wouldn't go in the book. Like, why would it, you know, it was kind of like a two, two step approval process, uh -huh. you know? And I would taste her food, she would taste my food. Um, and the one thing that was really important for us that we kind of decided was the criteria was kan shui ma, which I thought was kan chun ma the longest time, but kan shui ma, and that, it just means like savory, um, savory taste, and it's kind of this, I, I think of it as like tongue latching. Um, that's, a, that's a phrase that always gets edited out because <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything, but I, I think of it as like a flavor that I love surprising people um, with that first bite, and then you take a bite of it, and you're just kind of like, oh, wow. And then that's something that I, I like doing, and um, I don't know, that's something that I, I, I think my mom's food has, and um, I think it's something I borrowed from her. And, uh, I'm trying to think of examples, though, I don't know. It's like, is there, like, is there, okay, is there a dish laughing, yeah. that um, you really wanted to put in the book, and your mom was like, no, and you just, you bowed to her better oh. judgment? Oh, ooh, that's a good question. Okay, there's a tteokbokki that I didn't, that I cut out. So this manuscript was supposed to be 55,000 words or something like that, and I filed 70,000. So I was like, <laughs> what <happened?" laughs> He's going uh, to cut, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's really hard to like know what to cut from such a song so personal, and um, uh, hopefully, like, I think Emma Weinstein might be here, not to blow her spot, but um, you know, my editor at the Times, I, she stopped me to kind of, File in within the word limit of, uh, a little bit now. <laughs> <laughs> but when Raquel uh, Pelzo edited this book, when she got it, she was like, oh, it's so nice, but we have to, to cut it. Oh, it's kind of few words. I think we got it down to like 60K or something. But um, ultimately, uh, instead of cutting the, the essays and the words, we decided to cut some recipes because, you know, they always find their way back um, somehow. And yeah. The one recipe that I cut was the dakoki. I just wasn't, mm, I don't know. My mom and I, we both agreed about this. I, I, I wanted it in the book because it was like, I knew that people would love it. It was delicious, you know. Um, it had a lot of raw cabbage on top, but I think my mom was kind of like, you could do better. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of moments like that where, you know, luckily we had time, so there were moments at the end of each week where we would you know, have to clear out the fridge. There's like so much crap in there, as you know, um, when you're developing recipes. and. Our parameter was kind of like, well, we never went back to eat this, you know, it's been a while. We never went back to eat it, and so I think this is something that maybe um, you should cut, and that was that was the, the, the chickpeas. At first, the, the yam yam chickpeas, they were like this bright red, salty yeah, red, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, with the, the pamachim on top. That, <clears throat> that used to be like this really ugly, gross, like, soy saucy ground thing, and I was trying to mimic Kong Jo like this other dish that already exists, but by replacing it with the chickpeas, and then... What's in the original dish? It was just soy sauce, honey. It was kind of uninspired, and it, it tasted pretty boring, And but every time it got a little better, and so my family would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And then we'd, I'd be relieved, and I'd check it off, and then, you know, my mom would be like, it's not good enough, you should take it out. And so, <laughs> it's not so taking it out, but it totally it transformed into a better thing. And I think that, that kind of um, rigor was really important, because the book, the recipes that ended up in there are the ones that had to be in there, and that feels really good, it's like satisfying to, yeah. To know that those are the ones, and that yeah. you've edited the one, the anything yeah. that's. Yeah. Well, and I mean, also, you can save those and perfect them, and then they can go into your column later on, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your column. Let's talk okay. about your career a little bit. So you started out getting a PhD in literature, and how did you try, how did you change paths? That's a really daring thing to do. Yeah, that was a really, mm, you know, I think from about 10th grade in high school, I thought I wanted to be an English professor. And so I got pretty far. Um, I got through, right after college, I, I started a PhD at Columbia, and then I, I was there for three years. I, I, I loved being a student, I loved being a grad student, I loved teaching, I loved that. But then that third year was just being shut in and reading, you should like read 100 books and then do an oral exam at the end. And I was like, I don't know, I was, I was in my early 20s and 
didn't know how to speak yet, so it's really ironic. That I'm, and so I failed that oral exam, but I, they gave me like a low pass, and like no one gets a low pass. So um, I was like, maybe this is not for me. And but it ultimately, it, it led me to my first job, which I do write about in there. Um, yeah, sorry. Anytime I think about the, uh, you know, those like women in your life, the big sisters, like you know, those people who you can like pinpoint as the people who like. I joked in the acknowledgments that Michelle before you plucked me from the gutters of academia. So I was, <laughs> I was just like face down in the water. Um, and she was like, oh, maybe we got lunch. And it was this wonderful. Um, and so we should talk to her. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Michelle Bufardi is, um, she's now a VP of content at Food Network. So I had I had freelance for her a little bit, just because that's how I would make money in this during the summer. So when I wasn't teaching, I would um, kind of take a little contracts at, at Food Network and so she was an old boss and I met her for lunch and we ate this um, do you guys remember Morimoto under Chelsea Market? They they closed recently. It's like so sad. But um, I used to go there all the time because they had this salmon skin roll. It was really delicious. I remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so good. So good. And it was like the salmon skin was actually crispy and then the grains were like bitter and um, so I kind of mimicked that flavor combination with a maple candy spam and then Perilla, and there's a little, the little key prop in the book. But, um, and then the little story about how that launch was everything. Uh, and uh, she gave me, she was like, I don't know if you want it, but um, I have this job for you if you, if, you know, if, if you're, maybe if you have anything else to do. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll think about it. I had nothing else going on. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll think about it. And then um, the next day I was like, okay. And then, yeah, that first job was everything. I, my job was to data entry from you know the kitchen and from the editors onto foodnetwork.com. So it was very like entry level, you know, <laughs> maybe a little monotonous at times, but that's how I learned how to write a recipe. So I learned how to edit it because that's yeah, a skill. I was staring at it yeah. all day and, and then now I'm here. Yeah, well, I mean, it's those moments where they're like serendipitous moments and, yeah. you know, I mean, don't yeah. you, so much of life, you, it just, it's like those chance happenings or those people who yeah. just, say, okay, you know what, why don't you turn a little bit over here? Yeah. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. And that was a horrifying moment in my life. Like, I don't know if you guys remember a moment in your life where you just suddenly don't know what you're doing with your life. And that's really scary for, for me, for someone like me who's always looking into, looking at the future, which is ironic because I think I read the pop past a lot, but yeah. Actually, you know, I was going to ask this later, but let me ask this now, so I want to make sure that I get this question, just because it's about the future of the past. It's about the epilogue to your book, which is such a lovely essay. And it's about becoming an adult and the importance of leaving home and doing something heroic. You compare the, this leaving home to, you know, to Odysseus and, and journeying and, and then coming home again and how important that is to becoming an adult. Can you tell us about your, that, how that went for you? Just your... Yeah. Um, well, first of all, that essay was like four times as long and so much worse. So thank you, Rachel. <laughs> it's, so, it's so... No, it's perfect. It's so cute. It says like, what it is. Right, I was just right. I did that. So cute. <laughs> um, well, okay. I always like to say, you know, I, I don't want to be like comparing myself to to, to a hero. Uh, that's not because like our connotation of that word is a little divorced from the original kind of use of it, which is just kind of like the main character. And um, yeah, and then there's a joke in in contemporary language that's like being the main character in your life. Anyway, that 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 model of um, you know Greek literature was like a nice way to describe this very strange experience I was going through, which was writing about my childhood foods um, as a 30 year old in my childhood bedroom, you know, with all my like childhood things and like all the little trophies and the baby Jesus statues and but you know, it's just very strange like you know, when you grow up and you leave your house, you uh, I think maybe some parents are different, but I think a lot of moms just leave the room as it is. It's like maybe they refresh it a little with like a new couch or something, or not a couch, but yeah. But I just think that I was like in this really strange time warp. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was um, felt like I was seizing all the time and just like blacking out. Because like, because this um, this experience of being in your being with your family and living like you're 17 again as an adult, the very surreal experience and such a gift 
Well, so if it weren't for COVID, you probably wouldn't have moved home for so long, right? Um, so uh, it's kind of amazing. I mean, how do you do? You, can, can you even think about how the book would be different if you didn't have that experience? Yeah, I, you know, because originally the the proposal had a really bad title. I don't know how it got thought, but um, the essentials of Korean American cooking, and I feel like that's like a kind of book that gets written. But um, it, you know, and it was supposed to be a more reported kind of book where I, I didn't have the confidence to. I don't know if I had the confidence yet to like really lean into my, my family because I felt like I had so much to learn. So I wanted to travel the country and go into other people's homes and kind of like get a, some kind of compendium of Korean American, you know, cooking and, and experience. But ultimately, because I was back home, I, I, I realized that it was our dinner table conversations that had the most um, to say. And there was a lot to say in just this one house. So it felt it felt nice to, to tell that story and to be specific, but it was also really, you know, encouraging to just get to lean into this thing that felt familiar to me, which was memoir, memoir writing. And that's something that I, um, you know, had done a little bit before and um, something that I felt confident about. And I also learned a lot about the essay, you know, the essay form as a way to, um, it's not just telling a personal story, but it's, it's um, I think the essay, is cultural criticism. It's like a way to talk about uh, context and, and history and, and connections. And there's just so many moments at the dinner table where we kind of, I would ask questions about my parents' past or neighbors or like aunts and uncles. And I, I realized that if I cook through these dishes and I wrote them down, um, I would learn so much about um, about the current American experience. And, and not just that, but have some language to put it down on paper, and so I think that's what I did. And um, I also think that it's in the specifics that you're able to find like universal truths. So whenever I talk about you know an incident at dinner or you know a Korean mom opening my mail in the beginning of the book, uh, I've had so many responses from other Koreans being like, "Oh, that's such a Korean mom thing. Like that's such a." And well, that, I would say that that actually that's just mom a nosy mom thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although, I don't think my Jewish mom would have actually opened my mail, but I know she would have held it up to the light. <laughs> she would have waved the envelope. It's a big envelope, a small envelope. Yeah. Um, okay, so there you are, you're at home, and you're writing this book that you didn't think you were going to be writing, because you thought you were going to be writing this other version of this book. Um, and so another important part of the book, another character in the book, is the city of Atlanta, which I think is just also, you, it's, it's such a place, it's such a specific place, but it, I mean, it also is bigger than just a place. Um, so what do you think, do you think it's because you, what is it about Atlanta? Is it because you grew up there? Or is it something intrinsic to the city that makes it so big in your, in your story? You know, I, I think part of the discovery that I had while writing this book was how much growing up in Atlanta influenced me, the food we ate. And it's from really specific things like my mother using jalapenos instead of guayacochu, which is like a, another word for shishito sh peppers. Um, and just like we, I, I, I joke that I, um, it's not a joke because it's true, but I, I learned how to make grits before I learned how to make rice, I don't know why, but yeah, we just always ate grits. And so I think it was realizing that the place of origin was so much a part of the, the overall story. It's something I took for granted, and I think it's something a lot of us take for granted. Um, and uh, but we, we grow up, and we become adults, and then we leave home, and we never go back. And so here I was, um, you know, very unexpectedly back home, and really living there for you know nine months. I wrote a, wrote a piece about it, and I, I just think that that experience um, illuminated so much that I didn't know I would learn. And um, I'm glad I have a book that kind of documents a little bit of that, but I still have discoveries every day when I go back to Atlanta, just like, I just wrote about the about lemon pepper wings and, and strip club culture in, in Atlanta for my editor, Penley. And, um, and I just, so I'm still, I'm constantly learning, and I, so that's, I think that's why I have this obsession with nostalgia in the past, because there's so much that you can um, unravel and, and unveil, and that feels, feels really satisfying, and, and I still have a lot, a lot more to say, I think. Um, well, yeah, we have book two. So speaking of, of whatever book comes next, do you think you'll ever write that original book, The Essentials of Korean American? I mean, is that ever going to happen? Is that something you're still interested in in some form? 
Um, I think I'm interested in, in I'm interested in it in a form that lets me acknowledge that there are nuances in these cultural cuisines that, you know, I think there there's no one way to be Korean, there's no one way to cook Korean food, but I'm happy to like eliminate, you know, kind of patterns across um, a culture and so if, if I could do it in that way, I don't think I would call it the essentials of Korean. <laughs> I don't know if I, you know, quite believe that just yet, but I I, I do think that um, I, I I become more confident as a Korean cook, I think. So I still have a lot to say about Korean cooking in general, and because um, you know, learning how to use my mom's pantry, the ingredients she has in there, uh, that was a big moment for me, and uh, it kind of set my cooking free a little bit. I was able to um, treat these ingredients outside of their you know quote unquote traditional context, and that that helped me feel more confident about cooking Korean food and being able to say I'm Korean. And I might not be using this the way your mom used it, but that's okay because, again, I'm not your mom, and you know, and that's that's okay too. So I actually have a question about the Korean pantry um, substituting ingredients. So Korean ingredients are getting much easier to find in mainstream American supermarkets, but not all of them. So how did you approach um, when you were writing up a recipe? What are the things that you think people absolutely need? to have in their pantry to cook from your book, and things that you could substitute, and how did you think about that? Yeah, I have a very clear answer for that. Uh, you need gochukaru, you have to buy that <laughs> before you start the book. And you know, the chams, like gochujang, tenjang, um, soy sauce, and and kim, you need kim. So it's like kind of like these, like, you know, uh, just a handful of ingredients that I think, like, I want people to see their pantries um, as more expansive, and you know, there's this attitude a lot with recipes where people are like, well, I can't find that in my grocery store, but my whole argument is that, well, what if you expand your idea of what your grocery store is? What if it's also the five minutes down the block, H Mart? You know, it's like not that hard to go there if you're going there too. And so, then there's the internet, but what I would like to tell people is you can substitute anything you want. You can substitute the cabbage for like meat, you, the meat for, you know, you can substitute the, the, the base carbohydrate, you can substitute a lot of those things. But maybe don't substitute the gochukado and gochukado salmon. It's like, yeah. Yeah, we don't call it meat yeah, gochukado yeah, salmon. Yeah, call yeah. it a little bit pepper salmon. Right. Mention that on the video. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. And, yeah. Um, okay, I want to ask you quickly about strawberry jam, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys. Um, just because that was a surprise ingredient for me in the book. I was like, oh, strawberry jam. So what were you, what were you like, is that true? Yeah, yeah. I, I was researching yum yum sauce, um, and it's not really that anyone calls it yum yum sauce, but yum yum chicken is like that Korean fried chicken. It's usually, you know, a word used to describe that Korean fried chicken that's very red and glistening, has a very specific taste. And um, the original guy who claims to have invented it, um, he would put strawberry jam in that sauce, and I thought that was so interesting, but also really smart. Strawberry jam adds body. Um, it adds sweetness without the need for extra sugar, and I, I probably had extra sugar though. We'll see. But, <laughs> yeah. but I think ketchup. Um, ketchup. Ketchup, yeah. ketchup. But I think um, another like theory I have, which I haven't been able to prove yet, I have to interview the guy. But you know, he KFC started around the time he he like started making that chicken. And part of me wonders if like it was from the strawberry jam packets that he just like tried it in there. I, I have this theory, and I always associate KFC. You know, like fried chicken biscuits like with strawberry jam, so just kind of like makes sense to me in my mind. And we you know when things are a little close to each other in, in terms of context, you kind of you like, hmm, I wonder, and then you go digging and, and I'll, I'll, I'll oh, prove. that's the that's the yeah. funnest free association of recipe developing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we have to talk about that another time. <laughs> that's yeah. such a fun thing. But we're gonna ask you. We're gonna turn it over to all of you. So please ask <laughs> questions for Eric. Don't be shy. <laughs> you gotta tell. You gotta tell the truth. I know, and I, I, I know the answer. So yeah. I was taking a bath. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Street 
it's the best, <laughs> in my opinion. It's just so solid. I actually think they've gotten better. Like, after all these years, since the 1998 um, Ruth Rachel column, I just, I think they like, where she reviewed that restaurant. But I just think they got, they just keep getting better. And it tastes like home food to me. It tastes like, doesn't taste like restaurant food. And I mean that as a compliment. It's like, it really tastes like someone, someone cooked it with their hands. And, and they did, there's a tiny kitchen in the back where someone's cooking it with their hands. And I just, that feels really nice. And the, the panchan are all just extraordinary. I always say that you can measure a restaurant by their panchan. And, also by the kimchi, like man, that kimchi is really perfectly like fermented. It's just really hard to find that at a restaurant because restaurants are you know having to turn out kimchi and uh, so much like that, and they're they're so rarely just food rarely like Korean food rarely tastes that good to me in a restaurant. I don't know. So because you're used to your mom's cooking. Used to my mom's cooking. It tastes like my mom's cooking. I think. It tastes like yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very emotional, <laughs> and that will that will like make me cry. Um, it was a wild experience. I shot the book. I shot like some of the. I shot the Georgia scenes in Georgia, obviously with my my team, and then they they flew back up to New York to fi we we had, I had to chase them back there to finish the shoot. But I have a dog, and I usually drive, so you know I was driving, and I I stopped at a motel to get some sleep. But that was also when my like first column was first like piece was due as a staff writer at the times. <laughs> so I wrote it in a hotel room. Um, I had meetings with Genevieve um, in creepy Airbnbs. Um, she's like, "Where are you?" And I was like, "I'm just trying to get up to New York." Uh, but uh, yeah, I it, I think I didn't have the um, I didn't have I was so busy and so a little, a little kind of crazy that I didn't. I think I was going through so many emotions, and it was perfect because I was, as I was driving up to New York, I, I think I was able to re reflect on the year, and I think that was the the road is a great place to think and to kind of examine your life, and so it was a nice. I, I was given a lot of space before I got to the next shoot. I think to really just be so grateful for what had what had happened to me, this like magical experience, and um, yeah, I. That was a very surreal experience, and um, it's at the end of the book, so, yeah. You all have to read, you don't read anything else, read that essay, it's so good. Other questions for Eric? Okay, so, I'm from Atlanta. Uh, I drive by you for like every week. What are your favorite restaurants in uh, around there? Uh, Korea. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, I'm a little outdated, I think. Like, the restaurants I like are the ones I've been eating since I was little. But, um, so these aren't up to date, but there are family favorites. Gangnam is on Beaufort Highway, and it's just good Japanese food. So that sounds weird, but it's a Korean restaurant that, it's a Korean owned Japanese restaurant, but they have like these set lunches where they bring out very Korean things. And so, like, Hobak Juk is this pumpkin porridge they bring out for the first course, and then the second course is Adebap. And there's a risotto, there's a pumpkin risotto in the book that is inspired by that, you know, that taste. Um, the aibab is a like a flying fish roe kind of uh, dish, a bibimbap, and that is just so simple. But um, that flavor with the sesame oil and the flying fish roe that's inspired by a restaurant, by, the, by that restaurant kind of um, You know, I came out to my parents at Sushi Yoko. I was I was trying to not like tell people like you know where these places are because you know they're so close to my family and I'm just like. But um, I'm okay sharing that because it's, it's been published in the Atlanta Magazine, I think, recently. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are the spots that we usually have. Um, oh, you have to try the Sumo Hibachi uh, Wings and Grill. It's like something like that. Um, another Korean owned Japanese restaurant. Japanese restaurant. Uh, and, but it's, I love I love, Kurt, I love um, Atlanta for that. Those restaurants, you eat the food and you know there's like bulgogi in the fried rice and you're like, hey. It's like this is, and then the way they made their wings, just that one, that first bite of it, is they have this amazing lemon pepper wing that's just so perfect and candy and um, that, uh, writing that into that also told me that it was a Korean or Japanese restaurant. I was just like, this is definitely Korean. And um, I, I just love uh, having those moments of discovery where you just, well, where someone just does a really good job at you know, like what they do. You know, those are some favorites.
So for me, like I, I mess here, so a lot of my recipes come from my grandma, and it's really a test to like remember and remember. How do you let go of those feelings to be able to share this moment with people? Because I feel like I'm always afraid of judgment, because for me, it's like so secret. So how how do you let that go? Um, can you say the last part? Yeah. How do you? So the, the question is, um, she was saying that for, how does Eric let go of the feeling of being judged maybe for those recipes, that the recipes are so much part of, she was saying that she's Mexican and her grandmother's recipes are so special to her family. How do you, how do you let, let yourself go to actually share those really important recipes and then is there a fear of being judged? Did I get that right? I mean, it's such a great question. I'd love to know your answer um, whenever you write about your family, but like Melissa, um, but I, I, I think I, I think maybe there's a reason why my recipe developer. I, I'm never, um, so I don't believe in safeguarding, you know, good food, and I don't know. I, I think it's not that I'm generous. It's just that I think I, I really want people to taste it. I'm like, this is so good. You have to know about it, and so I think that helps me get get rid of that anxiety, you know. And that, that's why when, I, when, when at the end of the head note for the kimchi, Jane's perfect draw kimchi, it's like her kimchi, it's like the kimchi, um, I kind of have like a little stern, not warning, but disclaimer at the end, I'm just like, you better take care of this, like, you know, appreciate this, like, she gave it to us. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that. Um, and I don't know, I just think that, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I guess I, I, maybe I'm not that, um, you know, afraid of, of that part, but, yeah, I don't know, it's tough writing about family because you have to, I think memoir writing especially, you have to sort of pick which details are, are propelling the story forward. And because of that, you know, there's a lot that's not said. And I, I think if I know that, it's like an iceberg, uh, it's really cheesy, sorry, but yeah, you know, it's like an iceberg. If I know that all I'm showing is this, like the, the, the real meat of it, and that there's still all this stuff just for me and my family, I think that keeps me, that helps me um, feel feel good about it. That was a great question. Yeah. Are you Rambuches? What? Are you, sorry. <laughs> Are you Rambuches? No, I, I can't talk as a young man. Sorry, I thought I'd eat. <laughs> reading a, a recipe by Florence Fabricant and it was a really long head note and our head notes have to be like really short now but it was a great head note because it was just like this was influenced by this this and this and this was the original but this one does this this and this because of this and then this this and this and um, I was like yeah that's how, you, that's how you're supposed to do it you have to like give credit where credit's due so I think um, I think I, I think like it's not. I think I'm not worried about authenticity because um, I know that if I do the work and if I, you know, try to if I like show the full picture, I'm actually just like propelling the story forward. And so, you know, I have a blasphemous, you know, Pugovi dish in that. I have a blasphemous um, or whatever. But I think what 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 that recipe actually does is it. It's not just divorced from the past. It's it's. Um, it's propelling it forward, it's, it's, it's echoing the past. And I always felt that way about the relationship between the past and the present. And it's not that we're just, we can't just, we're not just like, you know, unlinked from it. It's, we'll always be influenced by um, past influences. And I, I feel for me, it's like, that's how I, that's the one thing I realized about my mother and, and my cooking. My mother's in my cooking, I can't talk right now, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just like, I think when I realized that I don't have to be separate from her, I think when I realized that um, me cooking the way I want to and um, is is a way of honoring her. So you know, as her as her son. So I think that's something that really set me free. I encourage all of you to feel free to you know play with your food and 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 and, and have fun with it. And it's it's a way to it's a way to honor the people who came before you.
I love that you just said that about showing your work, because it reminds me of, you know, my daughter's math problems. It's like not about the thing, right? It's about the process. It's about yeah. you have to show your work. Yeah, exactly. I think that's so just, you know, right on. More questions? Okay. If it's you next, sorry. You guys can't see each other. So. <laughs> um, you're obviously very close to your mother building in your stories. Was there, was there a particular um, facet about your mother or insight that you learned um, in the development of the book? Ooh. I'm sorry if I made you cry. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> She's a plant, isn't she? Um, just that's a great question. Um, I learned how much ego she has. Like, not a bad way. <laughs> Sorry, not a bad way. And when I say ego, I mean like, yeah, in the, uh, not in the platonic sense or anything annoying like that. But I just mean that um, I would ask her questions about her life, and she would ramble. She would go on and on and on. And I think she likes having the mic, you know, in front of her. Like she's. And then, on the other hand, she jokes um, to friends, like, never tell Eric anything or we'll end up in a story, and which is true. Um, but I, I think she, I realized how much, um, how much I didn't, how many, any stories about her life I didn't know. It's like such a simple thing, but that's really the joy of, that was really the joy of writing this book. Um, as a parent, I imagine you don't think to talk about when you were 14 and had this dish at a Kyung Yang Street restaurant, like, until your son, like 30 years later, is like, hey, why do you, why do, you do this? Or like, why do you eat this? And she's like, oh, good question. And so it's like making people realize things that they hadn't thought about in a while. And that was, that was a real joy, a real pleasure. Um, like my dad had this huge, huge, he's also similarly loves attention. And um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but he, he told me about his first fight in New York, uh, sorry, in, a, in Atlanta when he immigrated in 1983. And there's this, and we, we talked about it because there's a picture of him like this. He's like, his legs are crossed, and he just like looks really like swell. And um, I was like, where was this? And I was like, oh, it's at the Hartsville Jackson Airport. And that was actually the first picture as soon as I got off the plane. And um, he was telling me about, and then I went and had a, a biscuit. It was a KFC biscuit. And we kind of looked it up, and we found out that KFC opened up in Korea a year later. So his first bite of food in the United States was a KFC biscuit. And then, um, so I tried to recreate that biscuit, but then um, my, my reference point was one of my first bites in Korea as like a, I don't know, five-year-old who visited for the first time, because they were there by then, it was like the 90s. And so their KFC ha has like, the, the Korean KFC biscuit's very different. It's like, it's like glazed, it has like this honey crust. And so I tried to kind of fuse our, both of our versions of that memory into this recipe. And um, I love that recipe so much uh, because of that. And, I forgot what your question was, and just so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh yeah, so, and um, just, um, now I'm gonna put the white. Hi, um, I'm nervous all of a sudden. Um, one of the things I love about your writing is that you talk about yourself a lot. And I have kind of two questions. What do you think it is particular about food that makes it nostalgic? And why do you think it's important for you to write about nostalgia? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, are you a plant as well? Just kind of, that was a good question because it's something I think about all the time. I talk about it with my editor, Emily, a lot. Um, my Times column is where I've, I've been able to like, explore uh, the role of nostalgia in like different um, situations in the like, culinary life. And I think um, the reason I'm obsessed with it right now, I always say that I have like these two year long obsessions and you know, at first it was about eating for one, uh, cooking for one, and then the next two year obsession was, you know, this Korean cookbook, and then this, 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 this one is now nostalgia. And um, I think it's because there's so much to learn about the present when you excavate the past. Um, and I think the relationship between the past and the present is something I've always been interested in. And, and actually, my dissertation, if I had passed that exam, was going to be about like temper, not to be like, but um, it was going to be about temporality and ethnicity in 20th century American literature, which no one would have read. But um, I think people are reading this, you know, these essays now, which feels good. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Um, so I just want to remind you that you can buy Eric's book at the front and they're already signed. But if you want to have it personalized, he's going to be right here for a meet and greet 
um, and you are welcome to come and say hi, and you are the best audience. Thank you for an amazing question. <laughs> Thank you, I just cannot see that thing. 